freaking Silicon Valley Bank collapsing, going under. Totally done. Wild. All right. I was at one of their founder events. They paid for my lunch a few months ago. They were like trying to coup us to get stock unlocked to use their bank account. So this is also a pretty sad situation too. You know, I'm not, I know people try to jump in and make it political of like, oh, you're crying about money. So, you know, let's, let's just keep it at the high level of these yeah. businesses are a lot of people's livelihood, right? Whether you're talking about venture or startups, there's companies that aren't going to be able to make payroll. I'm sure the founders and uh, owners of Silicon Valley Bank did not want this to happen. Uh, this is being called the second biggest failure of a bank in U.S. history. Uh, there's about 175 billion of funds that are locked up. And of course, those are FDIC insured up to 250K. Thankfully, we do not bank with them. But yeah, it's a really rough situation out there. Like, um, I can talk a little bit too about how our payment provider, our personal payment yeah. provider is tied up with them. And that is affecting us a bit. What yeah, we, are you coming in with here, Daniel? Because I know you've been looking at this a lot. Well, it was in our newsletter yesterday. Well, just to follow up what you just said, yeah, we have uh, our most recent pay cycle at Stock Unlock is apparently currently in Silicon Valley Bank. We don't bank with them, but our payments provider basically holds the payments in their bank. And, uh, you know, we unfortunately had our payments in that bank while they were being transferred to our bank accounts, essentially. So we're going to see if we get that money back. Who knows? It's not a lot, thankfully, but... Uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot. It is, you know, a decent chunk of change, though, in there. Um, but we're going to be fine. Stock unlock is fine. We are not banking with Silicon Valley. We were actually, Jake, as you said, we were approached by them. And we didn't end up going through with them. They were offering us a really good interest rate last year. And that's when uh, interest rates were low. So basically, one red flag was like, how are we getting such a good interest rate when interest rates are like 1%? Like, you know, how is this How is this happening? Because money's not free. And whenever you see those situations, you should get a little bit of a red, sorry, of a red flag. Um, so the reality of that was, is I went to their events and came back to you guys, you and Nick, the founding team. I was like, this seems like a good deal. Like we could get 60K yep. a year in interest payments, which is like basically one of our salaries that we're giving ourselves to live. So it was pretty compelling and you hopped on yeah, the phone they, with them, right? Like, yeah, I had a meeting with them. I actually had two meetings with them and like they were really trying to sell us. Like they wanted to fly me out to New York. They wanted to bring me to events. They were like, we want to be your partner and everything. You know, we want to partner with your startup. And it's it all sounded just like... I didn't know they were going to fly you out. Yeah, I mean, dude, they wanted to fly me out to some events too. They wanted to get me in Vegas at one point. I was like, no, like what is happening right now? <laughs> And uh, eventually, <laughs> eventually, it just came down to you know, like we get we have a good bank, everything's working well. We're, we we were making decent interest. It was maybe like a twenty thirty thousand boost to the interest payments that we could have been making off of SVB. But uh, basically, the vibes that we were getting as a team, we just decided, you know what? No, we're not going to go with this bank. And in hindsight, like probably one of the best decisions we made as a startup is not going with the bank because we I'm were. In yeah, I'm in my parents' house, uh, dog watching for the weekend. So you guys can probably tell it's a different background. So I'm going to embody something they would say in this situation. All right. Smells like a cat, walks like a cat, talks like a cat. It's probably a cat. So if we apply that to this situation with SVB Bank, walks, talks, smells like when we're hearing, oh, high interest payments come out to Vegas. We're like, well, the interest rate environment, especially back then, wasn't that high. How are you doing this? It's like those little like sirens start to go off. And it's kind of sad yeah, because... What's it up? reminded me of crypto, honestly, like, you know, those crypto banks that were like, we're going to give you eight to 10% interest. And they were like risk free. So, and so I was like, whenever you know, that tie though, between SVB and crypto, right? Well, like, they were SVB was like the startup bank. That's what they were promoting themselves as. So I imagine, I don't know if they had ties to crypto. I don't, I didn't see any crypto on their balance sheet. Their customers had ties to crypto and like SVB was built on a fresh, clean stack. So they were able to, within their ecosystem, move money around a lot quicker than other banks. So there was a pretty big incentive for companies in the crypto space that needed to like move things around really quick to like have a like legit FDIC insured payment provider that will be able to like use USD funds on their behalf and move them around at that speed. So some of, there are like, you know, everything kind of cross hairs itself in this industry, but you know, they talk about how a lot of their customers are pulling out money, burning money really quick. A decent chunk of their customers either had businesses that were solely based on crypto or some aspects of it were, you know, touched by crypto. And we all know that's been getting absolutely decimated. Yeah. So I went through um, SVB's financial statements because 
you know, like Jake, you know that I like to invest in my banks. I like my bank stocks. So I, you like investing? I thought this was a an animal show. No, what, but are, we I, what basically... are we talking about right now? <laughs> no, but basically, I was like, I've never really taken a deep dive into this bank. Um, I've always avoided it because you know the interactions we had with them. It just, as we said, it was like almost a too good to be true situation. So I spent some time today and like looked at their balance sheet because I was like, okay, could you see the signs? Like, what were the signs that this was going to happen? Because they were going to fly like, you to Vegas, bro. No, like this was a major event that happened in the market. Like people are saying, you know, this is going to be the next financial crisis. I don't, I personally don't buy that. I don't think so. Um, but I was just like, what were the hints in the, in the balance sheet? Like, could you see this coming? So I went and I took a look at their assets right here. So as of the end of 2022, they had this number right here, this 211, basically $212 billion in assets. So you can see you know, they have other assets, non-marketable securities, held to maturity securities, net loans, cash and cash equivalents, and available for sales securities. So the available for sales securities and the cash and cash equivalents, this is the liquid assets right here. All of these other assets are, you know, they're assets that they cannot liquidate quickly. So the gray and the dark blue here was their liquid assets, which I believe equaled about $22 billion. So that's how much actual true liquidity this bank had. You know, this 212 number is is false. That's not liquidity. And then over here, what was this? Their liabilities. So this is their deposits. So they have $196 billion of liabilities. And basically 90% of that is deposits. So I think they had something like $180 billion of deposits. So how banks work is they take these deposits and then they go and invest it. So they take the deposits and then they invested it in these illiquid assets, net loans, health for maturity assets. So basically when people wanted to take their deposits out, they only had $22 billion available. And I believe I read something like there was $43 billion of deposits that were taken out just yesterday when the bank collapsed. And the reason the bank collapsed is because $43 billion tried to leave the bank. They had $22 billion of liquidity. The math doesn't add up and... They didn't, didn't have the money. Yeah. I think one important thing to point out here too is the type of things they invest in. You know, the they're not going out and buying AMC call options, right? They're investing in municipal bonds. Uh typically yeah, they have, uh, I think they actually had some mortgage backed securities there too, but typically slower moving, lower return, but you know, safer investments. And a part well, of were, the story. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was gonna say part of the story is the interest rates rising. So they were I don't making think... an investment plan in a lower interest rate environment. And a, they sold their loans at a one When they sold on Wednesday, it was a 1.8, or sorry, Thursday, it was a $1.8 billion loss. Yeah, but and that's they, not, I thought that's, that's not going to take down the bank though. That's not going to take down the bank. Oh, no, yes, sorry. The... I, I was just pointing out that they are losing money on their investments where they're taking customer deposits, putting those into investments. Those, they actually took losses on when they sold yeah. due to the interest rate environment. Like when the Fed started raising rates, they had a whole investment thesis that started getting blown up because the returns that they expected on some of those assets and bonds and things like that started flipping from the interest rates going up. Yes. When interest okay. rates go up, the price of bonds goes down. Um, yeah. Explaining that for the viewers. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. what were you saying? Um, yeah. That $1.8 billion loss I was just saying was not the reason the bank went under the bank went under because you know, they just simply didn't have the money. And I also have another screenshot right here that I want to show you. I think what we should talk about is what the CEO said, because a lot of people are actually blaming a lot of this on the communications because I'll paraphrase, but the CEO basically came out and said before all this crap went down, hey, don't panic, because if you do panic, everyone else is going to panic. So just like, so don't panic, though, like, be cool, be cool. And everyone was well, kind of like, well, Peter Thiel came out and like started a freaking like bank run in the VC world, or at least he's being like scapegoated for it. Maybe it was someone else. Yeah, but uh I mean, SVB put out a, a presentation, an investor presentation on March 8th, which is now three days ago, I believe, which is where I'm getting a lot of these screenshots from. And the investor presentation was basically 100% dedicated to trying to convince their investors that everything was fine. It was like a one-off special investor presentation. Like, we have all of this liquidity. Look at our $180 billion in assets. And then you look through the presentation, you're like, yeah, but only 10% of that is liquid. So you have $20 billion. And who their customers are also, which is very unique for a bank. People are saying because they banked with so many venture-backed startups and smaller businesses, yeah, yeah. And crypto, all that. 
Yeah, so this uh, next chart that I have here, which is from their investor presentation. So here's the thing also, is they were the startup bank. That's like what they were trying to sell themselves as. That's where a lot of their customers were, is startups. However, startups typically burn money. They rely on venture capital or you know investor money to survive. So this is the trend up here, this top chart. This is the US VC back investment activity. And you can see that since the fourth quarter of 2021, it's down something like 60 or 70%. So basically venture capital dollars have been drying up over the past year. Like it, th there's just not a lot of activity happening. So the customers of S Silicon Valley Bank, since they're startups and they rely on venture capital to essentially survive and venture capital is no longer coming, what it means is they're not getting inflows of cash anymore. So since these businesses are losing money and they're not getting inflows of cash anymore, what's happening is their cash is going down which means Silicon Valley banks deposits are also going down. So while that's happening, I mean, think about it, the bank takes deposits and then it goes and invests the money. And then if clients deposits are going down at the same time, then it's like this whole, it's just not a good situation. And you can actually see here that over time, this negative purple bar is how much money their, their clients are losing. Daniel, so, did they copy some of the design from our new financials tab here? Honestly, kind of like, I was like <laughs> I'm like looking at this. I was like, are we looking at stock and locks? Like it looks so similar. <laughs> yeah, honestly. But uh, that's what this is exactly. It outflows from cash burn from their clients and it's growing. So and the money is not coming in anymore because the VC market has dried up. So overall, it's just not a good situation. And, you know, that's kind of a risk. I think they were overexposed to the startup the startup world, like, you know, these are highly risky businesses. Well, I they're, wonder how regulators will look at this too, moving forward, right? Like, are they going to introduce new laws about like the makeup of who your customers are and things like that? Because this is like, this is straight up not okay. I mean, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, trust in the financial system. And, you know, we're looking at this at this point in time. I really hope, Daniel, that we don't flash back on this and say, wow, we were so naive if there's like a bigger storm brewing from this, because there's other neo banks out there Actually, to give people an inside look, we deal with our investors and we actually sent a notice to our investors yesterday informing them that we did not bank with SVB Bank. Simplest way to word it. One investor responded to us and we're kind of in line with this. They said, hey, you know, you should think about de-risking where you keep your assets, which is true. Uh, I won't name our bank here, but, you know, we do have our banking partner, which is a single banking partner. They are safe right now, but they are considering moving though. some of that over to a bigger bank now. Yeah, they're a neo bank and they're a private company. Um, and our investor that reached out to us and tried to give us some advice basically said, take your money out of neo banks. Like well, they, said, they said diversi diversify, not like a. OK, run. I'm not trying to cause it. I mean, it's, it's like all systemic, right? Like if everyone starts bank running on all these neo banks, but, but that's what some people are thinking about here, right? I mean, it's no. uh it's kind of a scary situation. I agree with you. I'm not sensing 2008 financial crisis vibes. I'm no expert there, but it doesn't seem that the states of the balance sheets and over leveraging is in the same position that it was before. We're also looking at a smaller bank as opposed to the bigger, larger ones. JP Morgan stock was actually up yesterday on this news. So our banking partner, Rippling, for example, they're a very huge private business. They moved from SVB to JP Morgan. So I'm expecting... Yeah. Morgan Stanley, JP, Goldman Sachs, a lot of these bigger companies to actually get more business from this and more consolidation. So depending on where you look, there might actually be some opportunity here. And maybe looking at bank stocks could be a fun chat for this stream because I know they're getting hit in the market. We actually yeah, have someone so, in the chat say that some good bank stocks are getting cheaper from, from router. Yeah. So if you, I don't know if you noticed, but JP Morgan was up like 3% or something yesterday. And it's, it's because of exactly what you said. People are taking their money out of the smaller banks that you can't really, I don't want to say you can't trust, but you just like can't verify the trust. And they're moving those into, you know, the large banks that have been around forever and have very solid balance sheets like JP Morgan. So I do think that JP Morgan is going to, you know, see more business from this. They could potentially get an influx of deposits. Well, that definitely happened yesterday. We at least know that our, I guess this is kind of insider baseball here, but we, at least we know some of our private bigger partners we work with have moved over to JP. Um, stock was up 2.54% yesterday. Um, yeah, just 
it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I, I'm really hoping there aren't other players that start falling out from this in terms of the domino effects. We also know the Fed was saying we'll raise rates until something breaks. Does this qualify as a break for them? I don't know. Uh, I think this is a break. <laughs> I think something broke. <laughs> so Okay, sure. But then there's the dial pull, right? So like when they say break, this is a neobank, right? As opposed to something else blowing up. I just don't, I'm not trying I don't to think their words too much, but it, it's not. I don't think Silicon Valley was a neobank. They were the 16th largest bank in the U.S. The the parent one, yeah, F fair enough. Um, it's just interesting, man, because like up in Canada, we have a very consolidated banking system. Like, there's five major banks. There's a like th there's a handful of smaller banks that you can bank with, but like the five major banks almost own everything here. And then you go down to the U.S. and there's like you know friggin' hundreds of banks. It is crazy. Yeah, I'm trying to bring up the new visuals for. Oh, you know what? We don't show them for banks. That's what's happening here. Yeah, banks aren't supported yet. We have to. Uh, <laughs> I have to plan out banks. I was gonna say I'm trying to pull up a feature that isn't released yet. If some of you guys missed it before, this is a little tease. We are going to be launching additional ways to visually analyze financial statements, which we're super excited about. So if you're seeing me fumble around, <laughs> that's what's going on there. So sorry if I'm distracting the stream, but. Uh, can yeah. I share my screen, actually? Oh, no. Can you? Of course. <laughs> Did you stop my? Cool. Yeah, I just... You know what? You. More importantly, I will tell you when you are or you are, are not using your stream, because that's the issue when it's just one of us here. It seems so common to, like, think you're sharing your screen, but you're not. Anyways, I can see it. Let, what's going on with okay. these, these financials? So when you're looking at a bank, one thing that you can look at is this metric right here, the loan loss provisions. This is the bank essentially setting setting aside cash today for potential future losses so that they can like build up their reserves for if things go bad. So this is a uh, SVB here. And if we zoom out, this is 2008, you know, this is how much they were building up. And then you can see here for the past few quarters, they have been building up a lot of cash relative to their history. So just remember this. Okay. This bank was basically building up a record amount of cash by far. Like if you take a look at the trailing 12 months, the amount of cash they've been setting aside for things to go bad has been, you know, record highs by far. Then if you go to a bank like, let's go to Royal Bank of Canada. And let's go and take a look at their loan loss provisions. I knew it was going to be a Canadian bank. I should have said something. Yeah, because I freaking love my Canadian banks. Dude, take a look at their loan loss great. provisions. Surprised it wasn't EQB.to. <laughs> Could have been. Anyways, take a look at their... Um, loan loss provisions, they're still all the way down here. And this is this is like across the board for Canadian banks and for US banks is the major ones. They're, they're not setting aside that much money for things to go bad. So basically what that tells me is they're not expecting things to get bad, at least anytime soon. Like they're still very well capitalized. But then again, when you go to SVB, their loan loss provisions are like at an all time high by far, which tells me that the bank knew that something was coming. The insiders, in my opinion, knew that they were they were going to have some issues because they were preparing for it for a few quarters now. They just couldn't set aside enough. They couldn't get enough liquidity. So just for the like viewers watching and also myself, sorry, that, that high number you're saying is the banks are. Can you just re-explain that once more? The loan loss. They provision? set aside. They can set aside cash today for expected future losses. So like since they take on loans, they can essentially set aside as much money as they want if they think that the economy or something is going to deteriorate so that when the losses start happening they have a reserve built so that metric is basically the bank building its reserves svb was building its reserves at a record high by far for like the past nine months every other bank that i've taken a look at is like their loan loss provisions are still low so SVB, relative to all the other banks, they knew that something in, within their bank was going to start breaking. At least that's what the metrics look like. But they put out that special shareholders report to say everything was fine. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, really, and, then the, really and, then the insider, and then the CEO sold $3.5 million worth. <laughs> just trying to, you know, keep everything, keep everything cool so you can get his money out. Yeah. The summary of this for me is we were dealing with this bank six to 12 months ago. They were taking me and other founders out for nice lunches in New York City. I was like, how are they getting this money? They tried to take you out to Vegas. Nice people working there. But wow, this is a fiasco for sure. People, 
and the comments are saying some pretty good stuff too. You know, this is just a bank being managed poorly. Fair enough. You know, it seems like you have to have a better mindset of who your customers are. And it's just a mess. My heart goes out to the people affected by this too. Like, you know, we have a lot of startup friends. There's companies that can't make payroll. YC was calling this a Y Combinator potentially an extinction level event. So I guess we're going to have to, you know, sit tight for and wait see. They said for startups specifically. That's why I don't think that this is going to trickle through the entire economy. It may have some effect. Like we're feeling this a little bit with our payroll that is in SVB right now, unfortunately. So I think there might be some things like that. You know, some people are definitely going to get hurt from this. But in terms of the entire economy, like I, I, I struggle to see this taking it down. It's not a good thing, but I, I agree. It doesn't sound like it will tear everything down. I have a prediction on this, Daniel. So some of these companies are getting hit hard. Valuations are getting hit hard. I think we're going to see some more M&A activity over the next 12 months, specifically from bigger players that have stronger balance sheets going around, looking at these startups yeah. that are having trouble raising, doing flat rounds, doing layoffs. The value, valuation could have collapsed from you know the 2021 peak. So there might be some good deals out there. I know we own some of the bigger tech stocks in our portfolio. I know Airbnb also has a lot of cash on the side and well, CEO said in their last call, they're going to be looking at opportunities. What's interesting is uh, the Canadian banks, as I said, the Canadian banking sector is like so consolidated now. I, I have something in my memory deep that the Canadian banks cannot, act, the five major ones cannot actually acquire any more Canadian banks because it's already too consolidated. I don't know if that's correct. So fact check that. But what they're doing now is TD is a Canadian bank, for example. They're starting to acquire U.S. banks. Another one, BMO, is starting to acquire U.S. banks. So if this does cause the banking sector valuation to go down, which it is, then um, yeah, I agree. We could definitely see some acquisitions coming. It could speed them up because, I mean, things are just getting cheaper. Um, the only last point I wanted was basically, like, I don't think this is going to bring down the economy, as I said. So if the entire market wants to continue dumping and tanking, like, there, in my opinion, there is some fantastic businesses right now selling for some pretty attractive prices. So, I mean, if you think 10, 20 years out, I don't think Coca-Cola is cheap right now, but I'm just going to use it as an example. Like, is Coke going to be here in 20 years, do you think? Yes, I can almost guarantee that. So if Coke stock gets down to a ridiculously cheap price because some bank somewhere collapsed, then like it could be a good buying opportunity, in my opinion. So yeah, I'm going to be I mean, on the lookout. I'm definitely going to be on the lookout. All across the market. I mean, I know I'm pretty cashed up. Like I've been dollar cost averaging lately into some of my positions, but overall have kind of been sitting on my hands a bit. And you're right. I uh, might take the crowbar and crack open my wallet and uh, <laughs> buy, buy some stocks. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, this is, uh, I agree with you, but this is SoFi's loan loss provisions. They are going up. Now you got to also, you know, you do have to think about this a little bit because as a bank increases its assets, the only rational thing to do is to increase your loan loss provisions as well. Because when you take on more assets, they take on more loans, which just means risk goes up. So if a business or a bank is increasing their deposits quickly or their loans, then it makes sense that they're setting aside more cash. And uh, I believe that might be the case. What was that figure though? It looked like it was only like 14 million. I thought I saw there on their loan. Yeah, that just this. sounds low, right? I don't know why I can't find this right now. What, what are you looking for? I was looking for, their, well, their total liabilities are going up a lot, like a lot. They have gone from 3.5 billion to 13.5 billion. Yeah, and uh, uh, from the chat here, there? from the chat here, Daniel, Sonny, the person who asked this question is also saying, SoFi is exposed to student loan default so there is a risk there yeah i think i think the makeup of their loans which is something we can't see here is incredibly important yeah sofa is a weird one i'm honestly not confident in any opinion i have there yeah I, um, I bought a few that was the only SPAC i bought like just for fun i bought four shares of ipoe i it was like it was pretty cheap it was like 25 or 30 bucks or something i think i made a few dollars off of it because it ran up but yeah it's that that stocks hit the floor though because i was trading around 22 ish maybe like a year or so and it's been pretty consistently between like five and six seven bucks lately yeah um new bank i cannot find their loan loss provisions i don't know if they report it 
or not, but uh, their loan loss provisions are not here. That would be interesting to see, though. This bank is growing so freaking quick, man. But yeah, basically what it comes down to with a bank is like you have to be confident basically in the assets they hold, the management, how much risk they're taking on, like where they're putting their, those deposits. It's not an easy business to understand at all. And yeah, like, yeah, you can have a time bomb. You can buy like, for example, you can buy SVB thinking, oh, well, you know, it's a bank and it's growing quick. But if you don't take a look at who their clients are or where their money is and how liquid they actually are, then it's like it was literally just a ticking time bomb. I like that you say that. And one of the things I really like about this show is you and I have a Venn diagram overlap. I think of things we invest in, like we agree on some things, but other things were I wouldn't even say disagree, just looking in other directions. I don't own any banks, to be clear. You do. So my angle looking at this is it's like this is almost like confirming my suspicions of like, I'm not saying I would never own a bank. And I know that they are good businesses. I could pay dividends, full respect there. Every time I look at them, I'm just like, it's so boring to me. And it's like, you realize like who's making up each other's loans and like, where is all their money invested? Like what type of bonds and like, how are they getting returns? Like where are customers deposits coming from? And like, there probably are like good businesses here, but since I can't explain it to a five-year-old personally, I've been looking elsewhere, but you know, that's why people like you are hopefully able to capitalize on this. So I'm cheering on your bank holdings, especially EQB. It seems like a lot of people in the chat also own banks, but I don't know. Who, who else is with me here in the chat? Anyone else not a bank stock owner? Or am I on a lonely island here that I should ship off of ASAP? <laughs> especially as these deals come up, right? Like if a bank starts trading below tangible book value and it's a big bank, that's... It smells like money to me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the fact that they're boring is also why I think they can sell at a uh, really cheap prices like equitable bank, for example. Um, it was selling for a six PE not too long ago while it's growing earnings per share at 15% a year. It's like, you don't find that outside of the banking sector. Really? It's, it, I don't know, man. I, I, okay, I, I would say you can find that outside of the banking sector, but it's like hard, maybe like not as often. Yeah. Like the frequency of finding banks like that in that industry, which also like does make it harder though too, right? Because it's like, if multiple of them are trained like that, that again, you've got to take that deeper dive and figure out why. 